Hi, so second video on um, structure determination, I'm going to deal with infrared spectroscopy. Um, now, to start this off, let's look at where on the electromagnetic spectrum, where do we find infrared light? So it's a type of light, it's lower energy than visible light. So you've got visible, you've got ultraviolet end is the higher end, the higher energy end of the electromagnetic spectrum and infrared is the other side of visible. Watch. There. So that's the visible region, higher energy, lower energy. Frequency, lower frequencies, higher frequencies. So in this section we look at infrared light and we shine infrared light using a spectrometer, we shine it through compounds in order to give us some information about the structure of that compound. Right, so a bit of blurb here. So, no, preamble. Um, I want you to, I want you to think about molecules and just in your mind's eye try and picture the atoms being joined together with springs rather than as we normally draw them with sticks so I suppose what I'm talking about is if you think instead of H O H. If you were to think of it as H with a spring attached to an O with a spring attached to a H, then I want you to not think of these bonds as rigid. Bonds are not rigid. They are bendable, they are extendable, they can stretch, they can bend. So thinking about them as springs will give you more the right kind of feel that I'm going to talk about. And what happens is that if the atoms can do this bending and stretching and moving about as they do then we need to think about that to understand infrared spectroscopy because infrared will shine light onto a compound shine light onto a compound often sandwiched between sodium chloride discs highly polished discs you don't need to know that but it will, it will shine infrared light of the right frequency through the sample and it's the bonds that will absorb that light. And when they do, the bonds will, they might start stretching. So this might end up being further out here, H. So that, that is a stretch. So bonds can stretch if they take on board some infrared light. Or what about this? What about... These are bonds that are bending. So they don't have, they don't have to stay straight, they can bend. Sometimes they will take light in and that will cause some bending. So whether things are bending, whether they're stretching, whatever they're doing, these bonds will take and absorb some infrared light. Now, if the infrared light has been absorbed, then those molecules are higher in energy, they're less stable, etc. But if, it, if it's been absorbed, and we're looking at how much is going in and comparing it to how much is coming out. If it's absorbed, 
that not all of the incident light that we shine into the sample will come out. So if we shine light in and 100% comes out, that's zero absorption or 100% transmission. But what if we shine 100% light in and only 80% comes out? That's absorption of 20%. The transmission is 80%. So if we look at the absorption, then the spectra are drawn with a pen on a piece of graph paper. The, 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 the graph paper, the pen just draws a straight line until there's an absorption and then the pen dips down. The graph paper is continually moving across and then when it goes back it looks like a, an inverted peak. It comes down and up. I'll show you some examples in a minute. But that's the nature of infrared spectroscopy. It's where the incident light, the infrared frequency light, is absorbed by bonds, bonds that are either stretching or bending or moving in some way, rotating is another, they can rotate to take on board infrared light etc and having absorbed the light then we'll see it in terms of a, a drop in transmission. So let's understand what happens. Um, these kind of diagrams I'm going to use more in future spectroscopy particularly to do with NMR but I just wanted you to have some idea that light can come in and electrons can pick up the light and change from whatever level they are ground state to excited states and if the opposite happens if electrons drop down then they give off the extra energy that they once had they give it out as light and the photons given out can be quantified in terms of what frequency they are etc using that equation the change in energy between those the change in energy is Planck's constant times the frequency of the light that's given out so it is the absorption the absorption of infrared light that causes this spectrum to be seen the molecule becomes more excited each bond absorbs an exact frequency of the infrared that you're shining in. Different other frequencies will not be absorbed. So one bond will only absorb particular frequencies. Like if it's bending, there'll be one frequency for that. If it's stretching, it might be a different frequency for that. If it's rotating, different frequency for that. But those three frequencies will be absorbed. All the other frequencies of infrared will not be absorbed. The transmission will be 100% for the others. But for these three, the transmission will dip down. And then we see those as peaks. With organic molecules, when you've got lots of atoms, lots of bonds, doing this rotating and stretching and bending, then we're going to get lots of peaks and you might call them absorbances, peaks, whatever, it doesn't matter. We'll have a look at some spectra in a minute, but they all give information about the bonds that are present. And if we know and have some information about what bonds are present, then we can try and piece together what unknown that chemical is. The AQA data book gives you a table of common absorbances. Now, that's the, the page we're talking about. That's the infrared table. You will be given in your data book that table and you'll have to use it. Now, I tried copying it and I couldn't really quite copy it well enough. So I, I've, I've just taken something similar off the internet. Look, that bond will absorb at these frequencies. Now, let me try and explain that a little. Um, if, if you take
a one centimeter length. If you take a one centimeter length and say you've got light as longitudinal waves like this, and you know that a wavelength is like from there to there, that's one wavelength. Well, what we're talking about here, the numbers, the wave number is how many wavelengths have you got in one centimetre? If you've got 4,000 wavelengths in one centimetre, then that frequency is higher frequency than if you've got like 1,000. So if, if we look at these wave number things, then the wave numbers, they start that end, the higher energy end, the higher frequency end, 4,000 wavelengths per centimetre, called wave number, 4,000 wave number per centimetre is a unit, and on this side 500, then this is a typical made up sample by me, I've drawn it, that you get like there's no absorption here no absorption no absorption and then something is absorbing the infrared light something absorbs it and as soon as you get past that frequency you change the frequencies from 4000 down to 500 wave number as the frequency changes that frequency is absorbed and before it is not absorbed after it is not absorbed that is typical. So you get something's happening there. It may be rotation of one of the bonds specifically, or it may not. It may be some bending, or but it's definitely something. Something is causing that. And then as the frequency changes more, then the transmission drops back to 100%, zero absorbance. So we call this a peak. That's called a peak. That's called a peak. That's a broad peak. This is a, um, a narrow, sharp peak. But we do get broad absorbances as well, which, which will be caused by some movement. Um, often hydrogen bonding will broaden a peak if you've got hydrogen bonding present. And then we get like regions where lots of peaks may overlap. And if they overlap, then we see some weird and wonderful shapes like that. So this is a typical infrared. If it was absorbance, if that side was labelled absorbance, we'd have to label this 0% and 100% 100% down there. So if you're going to label it absorbance, change your percentages round. If you're going to use transmission, then keep those percentages. But the relation between the two is that transmission is 100 minus the absorbance. So that was just made up by me so that I could talk you through it, through about how you get a peak. So to recap, if light goes through, the transmission is 100%. If light is absorbed, then the transmission drops and these things we call peaks. They may overlap, they may be broad, they may be sharp. Let's carry on. Now, where do we get absorbances and what produces those abs absorbances on such a spectrum? So the idea is that we get our unknown sample and we shine light of all these frequencies, all these frequencies through our sample and then look at the graph at the end, the spectrum at the end. Now, when I was a lad, and I was running these in our Sheffield University laboratories, the machine did scan from that wavelength, and you waited for a couple of minutes while it went all the way along until it finished. And then you ripped your graph out, and you could look at it. I think more modern machines use something called Fourier transform where they get all the frequencies of light wow and they zap them in one go 
they throw all the frequencies of light and they get whack the whole spectra uh, developing straight away rather than this waiting a couple of minutes while the machine one by one went through a whole load of frequencies anyway that sorry that that's just me rambling on but let, let's carry on a look right this is your bread and butter guys this should marry up with the table so the table tells you these regions and these are the regions you've got to look out for i would say to you the most important one is carbonyl so look carbonyl there carbonyl stretches at that figure there between 1650 and 1800 carbon triple bond nitrogen nitrile carbon triple bond carbon in things like ethyne so triple bonds you get smaller peaks but they're in this region you get or oxygen, hydrogen, water, or alcohols absorb in this region, 3, 2 to 3, 4. So around here, big absorbance often indicates hydrogen bonding. These are carbon-hydrogen absorbances here. Carbon-hydrogens are here. So what's this region? Well, that's known as a fingerprint region. And we'll be looking at some samples in a minute, but I want you to be able to, given a spectrum, identify certain peaks. And if I take you from that side, as you come this way, I want you to identify oxygen and hydrogen is very common on exams. Oxygen and hydrogen will show there and you can look it up and you can <coughs> double check. It's often a, a broad, broad absorption, not a narrow absorption, it's often a broad absorption because of hydrogen bonding. And then, as soon as that's over, you get carbon-hydrogen bonds. Now, seeing as we deal with hydrocarbons, it's not surprising that, that carbon-hydrogen bonds are so prevalent. And therefore, the carbon-hydrogen bonds happen next. And then I want you to think about triple bonds. Triple bonds come next, then the carbonyl bond, which is very common, and then you get loads of different absorbances caused by carbon hydrogen, carbon carbons, etc. And those loads of them all kind of merge into one, and they they are not identifiable because there's just too many, too much overlap going on, etc. And that region, the fingerprint region. As it says here, generally not useful. Uh, typically happens between 500 and 1,000 wave number. That region, although the notes say it's not useful, it is useful. How can it be useful? Well, say you've got X, an unknown, and you go through this process of trying to work out what it is, and you say, yes, it's chloromethane. Well, if you go to a laboratory and search in their books or search on the internet for the mass spectrum for chloromethane, then the chloromethane spectrum you get from the library should marry the chloromethane that you've got, that you actually run the sample on yourself. And that fingerprint region should be very similar in shape. Very, very similar in shape means it must be the same. Obviously, you can compare all the other peaks due to the other functional groups that may be present, but the fingerprint region is useful when you think you've got something to compare. Compare and have a look at which, with the comparison, if they're the same, then you prove your point. So, fingerprint regions can be used useful in that way let's have some have a look at some real spe uh, spectra right ethanol so broad hydrogen bonding gives broad absorption broad absorption oh your table there 
tells you our age of the world between 3, 2, 30 and 3, 5. 3, 2, 30 and 3, 5. So that's 2,000. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4. So 3, 2, 3, 2 is probably about here. And 3, 5 is probably about there. there. So yeah, that definitely the OH. So use the tables. Use the tables in your data book. Don't forget they are there. And use them to identify that as an OH. Then you've got a region here, CH bumps. And again, it'll marry up with the frequencies that are in the data book. Then you might think about triple bonds. Now, this is real spectra. So in real spectra, you have thing, th something called noise. And noise, that might be just a bit of noise. So I'm going to ignore that. If it was a bit deeper, then it wouldn't be noise. But uh, because we know it's ethanol, because we know we haven't got any triple bonds, I'm going to call it noise. Then this is the fingerprint region from 1000 downwards. The fingerprint region is too complex. We never identify peaks in the fingerprint region. But just short of the fingerprint region, carbon bond oxygen. If you look it up, carbon bond oxygen, it tells you those carbon bond oxygens are between 1000 and 1300. So that's 1000, 1300. That's round about here. These are the carbon bond oxygen um, bonds that are causing the absorption there. So interpreting spectra, that's where the money is. The important thing with getting good at this section is to interpret spectra. And you've got to get your hands dirty and do it. You've got to get down to some spectra and get the table at your fingertips and use it to try and work out and then see the more you do practice makes perfect right next one i just wanted to show you hexanol compared to ethanol both alcohols so how would you expect them to be different well they're both going to have an oh they're both going to have ch bonds they're both going to have a carbon oxygen bond where the alcohol is joined on. They're both going to have a fingerprint region. Now, mentally, take a picture of that. And if I switch you over, hardly any difference. Look. OH. Carbon hydrogen. Fingerprint region. Carbon bond oxygen. So there's hardly any difference because the bonds within ethanol and the bonds with hexanol and ethanol, the bonds are all the same. Oxygen and hydrogen attached to carbon, carbon and hydrogen bonds, carbon and carbon bonds. Because the bonds are the same, the spectra are going to be the same. Right, now, then I try to pick something different. So, hex 2 on, a ketone, hexanone. But the ketone, the carbonyl is at the 2 position. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbons. So, I wanted to show you the carbonyl is common in exams. There it is. It's a strong absorbance. You see it. And it's about 1780 from memory. So, in, in, obviously it's a shift. I think the, the thing it tells you is it can start at 1780, 1750 and go down to 1680. So this one is 1716, definitely that one. So can you see the strong absorbance peak, narrow peak, as it absorbs, that's carbonyl. And that is very common. Fingerprint region... For comparison, CH bonds, there's no hydrogen bonding, there's no oxygen, hydrogen, big absorption at the beginning because it's, there's no OH. So, what can I say? What regions, can we just recap? What regions are you going to look out for? Starting from the left, starting from the 4000 wave number, coming across from left to the right to the 500 wave number 
then I want you to see the following. Large broad absorbances above 3,200 are due to hydrogen bonding, often due to OH bonds. And then look for carbon-hydrogen bonds next, which uh, sometimes these two regions overlap. And then look for multiple bonds. That's triple bonds, uh, whether they're carbon nitrogen, or I mean carbon triple bond nitrogen, or carbon triple bond carbon. Those triple bonds will show up next. And then when you get down to about 1800, look for the carbon ion. So carbon ion absorbs there. And then un underneath that, in after that, you come to the fingerprint region. They may well throw another bond in there that they've given you the absorbance for. And all you've got to do is to look for it. Look for it at the bond absorbance they've given you. And then you can see if it's there or if it's not there, if they give you such an absorption. So the fingerprint region, that's like got too many absorbances for you to identify each one individually. What you do is the whole lot, you just look at the shapes. And if you think you've got something, you compare the fingerprint regions to work out and to confirm that is what you have actually got. So, final words of wisdom. Practice. Your confidence in this section will only grow as you do more and more of these examples. So get the examples done, do the practice, interpret spectra, because it will be required of you in an exam. Okay, take care guys.